Recording in progress. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Danger Ranger podcast. I'm your host, Zach Allard. This is episode 18, and we are with one of my friends, Trevor Burnett. Trevor was a mortar in 175. Um, I know I get a lot of questions about, oh, I'm scared if I get 11 Charlie instead of 11 Bravo. Well, he's here today to answer all of your concerns and to uh, maybe alleviate them and or make them worse. <laughs> so thanks for coming on, Trevor. This is uh, I'm excited for this one. Yeah, no problem, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So why did you, we'll, we, we'll, we'll do like we do it with all the other guests. Why did you join regiment? Like what was your, what was your uh, kind of enlistment story? Yeah. So I guess the reason why I joined, I wasn't, I guess the typical, I didn't come right out of high school or right out of college. I actually joined very late. I was, I was 26. Um, but the, the reason for joining uh, on my dad's side, every every man had been joining the military since World War One, and it was kind of, I guess, rite of passage. Every everyone just did it, and I was getting to the age where it was either going to happen or it wasn't going to happen. And so, actually, my little brother beat me to it, and ended up joining, going 11 X-ray, Option 40. And so, I actually went to his RASP graduation, his RASP graduation. And I guess it was there where the competitive side of me was like, all right, I'm going to go back. I'm going to enlist. I'm going to do the exact same thing he did. Still had no idea really what a Ranger was besides Black Hawk Down and basically what I saw from my brother. But uh, yeah, I went back, got the 11X option 40 and ended up waiting about nine months to get in because I was stupid and ended up disclosing this uh, heart condition that I had. Um, which they told me that they told me to lie about it, but even, even I knew any like half ass medic with a stethoscope would be able to just hear the heart murmur. So I ended up mm. disclosing it. it took nine months, but yeah, finally went in, in March of 2017. <clears throat> that's when, uh, I was told it was like, everyone's just going to get 11 Bravo. It's very rare. Anyone gets 11 Charlie. And so you get to a reception and processing before basic and like two weeks before you actually class up that's when you're told or no two like two days before you class up they're like all right 90 percent of the room went over here they're like all right you guys are 11 bravo and this little section right here like all right you guys are now charlies and so oh, the majority what? of people are asking well what what the heck is a charlie i i kind of already knew my fate because i had done like a lot of research before i went in i was like uh oh crap man we're gonna be uh we're gonna be mortarmen <laughs> so, <laughs> that's like kind of how the trajectory for first started oh how'd that how'd that feel uh you know i, I tried to see like the positives at first i'm like all right hold on that's not that great i was like we're, we're carrying like an extra capability we're we're still infantrymen but we're also going to be more skilled and we're going to carry this uh this mortar capability and then it's just immediately like, even before we even like left for basic, it was just people just shitting on shitting on motors. It's it's just the it's just the the stigma. Yeah, for sure. So made it through basic, and then you went to airborne school. I think I think they were still doing airborne school before RASP around that time. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, you go you go to it was it was basic then go from basic airborne then airborne right over to pre-rasp uh, i think i was there for like six weeks before i before i class oh, wow. we had gotten there right as a class was was classing up so we were like the first group there and we ended up having to wait like six weeks before initially initially we got started yeah ooh, that's a that's a long time to be in pre-rasp i was only there for for two weeks before we classed um so how did you uh like what what kind of stuff did you do because i haven't had anyone come on yet that had a, an extended stay kind of in pre-rasp what was pre-rasp like uh so pre-rasp like it started getting for some reason the group before us whatever they did they they completely ruined it because i guess you used to be able to sit on your rucks throughout the day and just like read the blue book i mean it's pretty much pretty much all you did and unless the cadre came out there and just started screwing around with you we just had to stand the whole time so basically oh. <laughs> basically it's like every like a, a standard day is pretty much you do pt in the morning 
you get a time hack to get ready. You'll go eat chow, come back, and then it's pretty much just standing there reading the blue book, and then lunch chow, then standing there. It's pretty much pretty much all you did. Oh man, that's brutal. I mean, so for anyone that's listening, that's how it was, you know, almost five years ago. Um, so it's definitely changed since then. Um, I don't know exactly how it's being run right now with uh I know the current first sergeant of RASP. I don't know if he's if he runs pre RASP as well. I'm not too sure, but yeah, don't take that into heart. Pre RASP is just gay, regardless of what you're gonna end up doing, whether you're standing on the rocks or sitting on the rocks, but you're gonna be educating yourself on Ranger history and uh and the blue book. And maybe if you're lucky, they might give you classes on stuff, but yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, maybe a couple uh writing a couple of ranger creeds. Mm. That was <laughs> classics. <laughs> That's always like the worst day. Like, all right, you guys owe me 30 ranger creeds. Oh <laughs> uh, tomorrow morning. Oh. <laughs> so six weeks pre-rasp and then rasp. Were you a, a summer class or a winter class? So I got in, I mean I I did recycle once, but my initial was September. And okay. Yeah, went through in September, October, got recycled right after uh, Coal Range. I was a freaking land nav failure. And so had to go back for another three weeks and then classed up again in uh, November. Okay. So we went, yeah, I, I was a, a winner when I classed up in November as well, uh, back in 15. So yeah, it's cold. It gets cold out there, very <laughs> cold range. Um, oh, oh yeah. Like, yeah. It was, yeah, that was probably, that was probably some of the Your coldest second have, range. Yeah. Coldest I have, I have ever been. And it's only cause like, it doesn't matter if you can, and the thing about it is it's like, you can be from the North, you can think you deal with cold weather very easily but that's when you're dressing for it <laughs> when you're allowed to wear warm things yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah when you're just wearing your standard 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 duties it starts to get starts to get a little bit cold mm -hmm. so you recycled because of of land nav and then you kind of you, it sounds like you obviously figured it out by the second time through what was your your biggest sticking point on land nav I just like, so, okay, so my main, I didn't really, we didn't really do that much uh, land nav prep or I just wasn't naturally good at it. So one thing I started to do was at first was basically I would just dead reckon everything and I wouldn't even use attack points. So it's like, all right, wherever I start, we're dead reckoning <laughs> 800 meters and we're Ooh. just going to bushwhack. And oh, so no. that's what I did. It just worked out terribly. Because you yeah. get to a point, the first point really wasn't the problem. It was, I would even dead reckon from that point to the next point. And so it just wasn't a, a more, was not really working smarter. And so I guess from, from that experience, the, the second time I already kind of learned from my first mistakes and had that practice and obviously utilized the road a lot more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dead reckoning. Uh, man, I so I I threw up a, a couple land nav tutorial videos, and I'm like, hey, this is only used like if you're going less than like max max a thousand meters, and you're using an attack point. Like even then, that's like a stretch. Like I don't I don't like that dead reckoning more than like two three hundred meters through woods if I can avoid it. Like I'll always use something else, uh, like hand railing or backstop to to back me up there <laughs> but yeah hand rail yeah hand railing the the road that's definitely the way to go and then it's just like i guess kind of comes with time that's not the best place to use it but terrain features if it's on a, on a different course you can kind of utilize that a lot easier because then uh i guess the further up you go it becomes more about utilizing your time and if you're just dead reckoning looking at your compass the whole time you're not really going to make a lot of leeway at least more efficiently mm -hmm. yeah yankee north and i mean south is a little bit you can terrain associate a little bit more i think in yankee south um for yeah. those who don't know these are the the different land nav courses that you have for rasp and for cert um and yankee north is what you use for rasp um and that one's pretty there's like a couple like hills if you want to call them that 
and then it's mostly just it's pretty flat and there's a couple major roads that cut through it and there's like a couple of major intersections that are really good attack points but other than that it's really difficult to train associate in there <laughs> i think they're yeah and i think they're doing a lot i think that that was one of the things that they started um implementing a little more was guys seem to be getting a lot more uh land nav prep and everything because I, th I think the i mean the program has kind of changed uh drastically from what i understand from when we went through mm -hmm. i'm sure so made it through rasp and then did the uh the first ranger mortar guys ever come over and and say what's up to y'all before you graduated because i know that the third because they were just right there i know in our class they had a uh, the third ranger mortars come over and find out who the mortars were and like kind of kind of introduce themselves because it's a pretty small community really within regiment because there's only one platoon per battalion so everyone kind of knows each other yeah uh they they didn't so for my for my specific class originally i was going to 275 really um, okay. the, yeah there were no so there were no 175 slots for my class there was a couple 375 all the mortars were going to 275 hmm. and so no no mortar went to three in that class what happened was <clears throat> i'm in post rasp and one of the guys that was post rasp cadre at that time had also served in the same company as my brother and so when i told him that he's like oh, okay yeah i know i know your brother why are you going to two i was like well they, i already brought this up they said there's no one seven five slots like no no no. if you go to two seven five you and your brother literally are never going to see each other so yeah luckily uh that was like on a friday or whatever come monday got my orders one seven five was the nice was the only person in the entire class so i showed up there alone oh no <laughs> yeah like, like like completely like not just the only mortar just like completely alone um, oh geez yeah <laughs> and it, was, it, it was uh it was a. Uh, it was pretty awful. Uh, I was like, so I get there and we're in the uh, S shop just in processing and everything. Like what platoon are you going to? I'm like, uh, like mortar, mortar platoon. He's like, oh my God. He's like, that's literally like the worst platoon you can go to in, in Italian. <laughs> you're, you're, he's like, I just want to let you know your life, your life's pretty much over. Oh man. <laughs> and, yeah, it was, it was actually pretty crazy. So the day I got there, it was the day before uh, pre-deployment leave. For 18, I'm assuming. Yeah, yep. yeah, 18. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's in. So, I mean, damn near like eight or nine people come to uh, get me from the S shop. People are in, you know, roughs. Some people are in, are in duties, but I don't know who, I don't know what rank is which. So you're just calling pretty much everyone everyone's sergeant and it just started from there just went up to the nco office and uh it was just a, it was just a beat down for just several <laughs> several hours <laughs> and, oh boy yeah it was well yeah what made it worse was like the day before it was the day before leave so everyone's just like everyone's just chilling in civvies and everything mm -hmm. and uh yeah i just didn't know i just didn't know who was who so it was just <laughs> several hours of a uh, of beat down. And then like the, like always, like the traditional thing is they'll end your first day. They're like, all right, you owe me uh, two 1000 word essays. <laughs> <laughs> and so, along with like this laundry list of things that you need done by the next day. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't get any sleep. The, uh, that night show up uh the next day for everyone signing out on leave i wasn't and uh I don't, I don't know what the rules are or whatever at that point and they told me to show up in winter pts in a pt belt with a water source and so i show up to work every you know the whole company's in civvies and here i come the, the new guy just <laughs> yeah it was just it was freaking, it was freaking terrible oh uh. And you got a time hack to get into your roughs or whatever, but luckily I was kind of, I was kind of like, <laughs> I had somewhat a playbook of how certain things would go just from my brother's experience. So it was like, I was almost over prepared just in case they wanted to do like changing drills or whatever. I had like a set of duties. I had a set of, rough, like I had stuff like ready to go in my mm -hmm. bed in case. <laughs> uh, so everyone went on leave and you, 
you probably got left alone then for those uh for those couple of weeks. Yeah. So I so they ended up they ended up letting me um they ended up letting me actually go on leave for like the last week. Oh nice. And the reason was because I guess I was like one of those stories that you hear about in RASP where the cadre is like, well, you could get to your unit and you could deploy in just a couple of weeks. Well, I got there and they're like, well, you're coming on this rotation. So nice. it was like, I think I was, I think I was in a garrison, maybe a total of three weeks before I, I went out, but yeah, I ended up, ended up uh, getting that last week of leave beforehand. Okay. So you went right on deployment then. You got your rip yeah. issue, you got your sip <laughs> issue, and they're like, hey, put it all together on the plane over. <laughs> yeah, then no, yeah, like as, to- as far as like being totally green, like no, didn't, did, I mean, did not know anything, not one training event, anything. Basically, your, your knowledge that you took from uh, <laughs> basic, um, and that's it, so... <sighs> Uh, realized realized for like the first that was like the that was also the the five mother yeah yeah because i was uh i went to syria for that one yeah and so i was we were at uh bath okay the, the big guns team at bath and uh realized that actually uh be, be, being deployed was even at first worse than being uh in garrison because at, <laughs> at least you can go home where yeah you can leave you can get out of it you can't hide when you're uh no, living with the dudes <laughs> no and i thought i thought like the group that we had at first was like all that was going to be there well it turns out well no because you're you're at bath so it's like you got people with strike force and everything so it's like okay everyone everyone's here and no one's gonna no one's gonna leave me alone no, especially as the new guy, new guy, and you get the privilege of jumping on that deployment immediately. Yeah, I can only imagine <laughs> Oh, how miserable that must have been for at least a, a couple months. I'm sure it probably led up towards the end, did it? Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, yeah. well, I mean, you know, how it goes. like even guys that you guys that you hate. I mean, once you're living with each other for several months. Yeah, I mean, that's eventually... honestly probably ideal come to think of it it's like you get you just get maybe fucked down hardcore for like a month and then it's like oh we have to live with this guy let's you know kind of be nice versus work where it can you get a break from the dude and then i feel like it would maybe just last longer in garrison but i don't know <laughs> yeah eventually uh eventually got eventually did get did get better and everything luckily there was uh a dude at the time um really liked really liked now but at the time uh was not very well <laughs> was not very well liked so he kind of took a more uh running of the beating than i did mm. <laughs> there's always that one that's like you know kind of worse than you and he yeah he, he takes that uh takes the what's the word i'm looking for here yeah kind of just takes, takes the yeah he, yeah, he, to, he yeah. just attracts the attention as exactly long as, he, yeah, as yeah. long as he's there it's not gonna... he's the distraction <laughs> yeah yeah definitely did you have so, to did you have to did you have to shave your head your first deployment was that still no because we i went over for my first one uh was in 16 and we were getting blown out for uh a mission and so like we didn't deploy initially and it was like gonna be just for like a month or so probably and they're like, we don't, we don't want to show up and have a bunch of cherries because there was a bunch of us who hadn't deployed. And they're like, well, we don't want to show up looking like we're a, a cherry platoon because we might have to do this pretty high profile mission. Like we want to, you know, look presentable. And so we didn't have to shave our heads. And then that was my first deployment. So I didn't have to shave my head anytime after that. <laughs> did you, did you have to shave yours? Oh. Yeah. yeah, that was like, a, yeah, that was a, that was, that was a must. That was, um, which is every, which everyone, I mean, it was it was normally a thing so everyone everyone knows yeah. you're, you're the new guy when you're just walking around just bald and everything just barely starting to get your hair back from uh from basic training and they're like up oh, shave it off <laughs> oh yeah yeah that, that, that too. You're, fine, you're fine you are finally starting to kind of get your hair then nope uh nope. shaves it off but i only had to do it i only was required to do it once so yeah. by the time by the time deployment ended it was all kind of grown back mm-hmm did you get to do any anything cool on that deployment? I'm trying to remember the 18. Uh, so 
no so no i i i did not pretty much um there were guys that were a part of uh big guns which is 81s and 120s 60s are attached to the line uh the 60s that deployment actually had one time they actually got to shoot um which is that's rare <laughs> if you're on yeah if you're on a 60- in afghanistan at least yeah yeah yeah, if you're which if you're on a sixty team or everything, that's 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 a good, that's a good that's a good deployment because it doesn't normally happen. So yeah, they did, and then also the guys that were on eighty one and one twenties, with the exception of me and another private, they got to go support uh, a couple uh, group guys. Okay, nice. Because it was, was I think it was Seco uh, was the was in Bath in eighteen. I'm pretty sure because. My buddy, yeah. uh, Nick Ryan, Blue Jean operator, was part of that deployment. He was one of the dudes that got blown up on one of those missions. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Seco is the one. <clears throat> and that's, that's like, so that's like another thing about, I guess, if I had to say one of the cool things is basically mortars under, mortars within regiment, pretty much we are the only special operation mortars that there are. So. SF does have like a mortar capability along with Marsock. They might have a mortar capability, but they're not, they're not actual mortars. So sometimes you do get to get used by other units where the line may not. So Mm -hmm. there is, there is that every now and then. And so there there was some of that, that deployment. Especially in Syria. Like we had, we had mortars attached in like the Syria trip before our 18 trip. I mean, you know, and I know those dudes were getting after it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. In, in 17. Oh yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. like the, maybe like the one saving grace is like what you were saying is that we are the only special operations mortar teams or have the mortar capability as well as, you know, being special ops. So when Syria happened and they were making pushes into Iraq and stuff, the mortars were, there is a dude and we're not going to say his name, but he got pretty messed up <laughs> from the mortars. Oh, yeah. uh, just I mean, the I amount of ordnance that he was dropping. Um, he actually was in my RASP class. Um, but oh, yeah. He was? yeah. 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 He, uh, <laughs> yeah. He got, yeah. He got his bell, bell rung a little bit. Um, yeah. But the, yeah, the 17 deployment was uh, notorious. That's kind of where they made a name for themselves as far as just uh, all that they were doing because that they were used quite heavily that deployment. Yeah. They were talking like you go out for three days and you bring a truck full of rounds and you'd shoot all the rounds. You'd come back for a day or two, load back up and then go out and do it again. Just using all kinds of ordnance too, not just us. It was, uh, I think it was a lot of Russian. Was it Russian or what was the other? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it was, I don't think it was, no, I don't think it was, I don't think it was Russian for, from my understanding. It was it was another it was foreign mortars though it wasn't because they were just shooting we they went they winchestered the American made mortars and they were using I don't remember which country I want to say that it was Russian but I'm probably wrong on that but they were using some other country's sketchy ass mortar rounds. <laughs> oh, okay, that's that's actually that, that's actually uh, which the the overpressure on those was apparently worse, which is what can I think contributed to to our buddies' uh, problems there after it um because they were just hotter i guess and the overpressure was worse and they were shooting in like courtyards and stuff so they were getting a lot of that that uh i think overpressure is still the right word for that but yeah. so we uh that does that does make sense because um whenever we shot them in uh iraq and everything for train for training uh that was i didn't i did notice that the pressure was uh the pressure tended to be kind of a lot worse. Mm-hmm. And I know there's like a point system for like when the dudes are shooting the goose. Is there like a, a safety measures in place for for mortars at all? Is there a round cap per day that you're allowed to shoot? No, that's the thing. No. There's not. Yeah. No, there's nothing. And if there is, I don't know. I don't know about. It, but there's nothing. There's nothing capped as far as like how many you're supposed to how many you're supposed to shoot in in one day. So that's mm. that's maybe part of the reason where a goose. A goose, it's like depending on the round, what? Three? Yeah, depending on the round and the firing position. Because uh, like if you're sitting down and you're shooting like a like a smoke round or a, not a, a smoke round, a loom round, because you're tilting it up and you're shooting into the sky, so you're you're much closer to that back back blast. 
Um, so it depends on the type of round and your firing position. But I, I don't, I don't know the specifics. I was never a goose gunner myself, but it's not very many technically. And there was definitely days where the, the goose gunner was shooting way more than what he was supposed to. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, certain. Uh, yeah, even like certain training events and everything, where you're doing like multiple iterations, that goose gunner is taking quite a quite a beating, <laughs> quite a blow. Yeah. All right, so 18, or yeah, the 18 deployment, you got back. Did you go to ranger school pretty soon after that? So I did a, uh, I did a training cycle. Uh, I was attached on a 60 team with, with SECO. Normally how, so how our training cycles work is uh, mortar platoons kind of broken up into two different sections. So you'll have what's known as big guns, which will cover the 81 and 120. That's, I would call that typical mortar platoon where your other section are two man 60 teams and normally it'll be like two mortars for each platoon. So did a, uh, did a training cycle and then left like, ha- cause I think that was the uh, 10 month training cycle. That was, the, that was the long one. The one after the five, the five month or. Yeah. I, I think that was the. Was that? I don't I don't remember it being particularly long, but I guess doing the math it was cause we didn't deploy again until July of 19. So I think that math, I think that math's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so halfway through, that's when, yeah, that's when I went to ranger school and I had a, I, okay. I had a long, a long route there. I think I left in, I think I was gone from February to August. Okay. So oh, six, yeah. <laughs> six months, uh, yep. did two Darby's, one mountains, and then Florida's where it all just went went to crap and did three did floors three. okay yeah we're we're we, we did the same thing dude two darbies yeah. one mountains three floridas dude yeah. swamp yeah. boxes <laughs> yeah. but yeah well brc and then brc recently. oh yeah you hit brc hit brc mm. and darby and oh no and, and darby too oh yeah set up the whole set up the whole best ranger the worst recycle you can do um because at least the other brc recycles you don't you're have not, that you're just, not being yeah. used as slave labor yeah so it's like just dude it's like just 12 14 hour days just setting up the, the course and the funny thing was <laughs> my brother was actually competing in brc at the exact same time i was <laughs> setting up for it oh uh, so that, that was actually that was actually kind of crazy that's kind of yeah that's that's the odds the odds of that are are pretty fun oh i know it's <laughs> yeah it's it's absolutely absolutely insane so yeah he he competed that year um and then everything was everything was fine. Then I got to Florida, and every anything that could go wrong uh, just went wrong. Um, that's when. So the first the first one, I ended up falling asleep. It, like they they briefed this so many times. Like the biggest safety violation is not falling asleep during swamp movements. And I fell asleep. Oh no! In, <laughs> in, in the swamp movement. Um, <laughs> Right at the uh, like, right when we're doing the rope bridge, just oh yeah, because you're just sitting there, yeah, like, just plop just down, to go. yeah, plop down. Uh, platoon sergeant was too out of it. <laughs> Everyone crossed. He's like, "All right, we're good." <laughs> He's like, and "They're like, all right." So they break it down. They set up for, and the RI does a check. He's like, "We're off by, we're off by two. Another guy had also fallen asleep. So there's two of us. Oh jeez, they wake us up by throwing these." sim rounds <laughs> the arty sims yeah his arty sims across the river because they're all on the other <laughs> side <laughs> oh no dude so they were uh all of a sudden i hear these sim rounds just going off i'm like oh i'm like dude i fell asleep and then there's this other dude like just like 15 feet from me i'm like all right at least i didn't fall asleep by myself um, <laughs> yeah i got like immediately immediately just got sor'd and yeah. so at first, I mean, they were, they were pissed at first, like, all right, well, you did like the one thing we said not to do. If you get recycled, you're going to day one. I'm like, Oh, oh geez. <laughs> I'm like, you gotta be, you, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, I've already been here so long. I, I gotta go. I wouldn't, there's no way I'd make it. <clears throat> so anyway, we get in front of the BC and everything. It's like, all right, you know, I know you guys screwed up, but I'm putting you back in. You guys are going to get your tabs. I'm like, 
All right, awesome. So just to <laughs> you had to go back to to Darby, or did you? Was it just no, the, no, no. the the I, the I, six hundred TV? Stay in Florida. Okay. Thank, well, because I. When I did my second recycle, I had to go back in front of like the fifth RT or the the whole RTB like battalion, like uh, brigade commander, I guess technically, yeah, Ranger Training Brigade, the brigade commander. Um, and I figured they might have sent you there because of the SOR. No, so luckily, I I don't think I don't think I had any like major minuses or anything like that. So both the dude I fell asleep with and everything uh, went there. I was like, no, you guys get just. I just went in front of the just uh, six RTB and. Just gave me the normal recycle. So did an, another stint. And then didn't fall asleep in the swamps. Didn't fall asleep. <laughs> Freaking gotta go and everything. And he got peered. Like the first, no! time, first time I've ever been peered in any kind of thing. And I I took it, I took it so personal. I was so I was so pissed. That last, that last Florida, I just didn't and to, to top it off, that was uh that was the when, summer recycle. Yeah, that's when six RTB was going on their block. Yep. So like, I caught <laughs> another four caught, four weeks. <laughs> yeah, so it's like I, caught, I catch BRC recycle in Darby, and then I get to Florida and I catch Florida's block lead. I was like, oh my god, I got <laughs> to be I got to be here for four weeks. So, dude, that last Florida, I just did. I just did not care. I didn't even. I didn't even. I don't even think I undid my ruck for anything. I just plopped down and just garbage bag sleep dude yeah and just <laughs> I, I did not did not care i think i ended up getting the go from like weasel Wh- whatever it was it was like for it was like first look go and then just cruise the rest of the time but yeah oh. it, was, it was the it was the worst experience like you can't pay you could not pay me to go through that again no amount of money i just don't care enough to ever go through that program again <laughs> It's like just after six months, it just does something to it does something to the brain. It's just yeah. <laughs> it took me it took me forever to like get back. Like I was because I didn't work out or anything. So it's like yeah. After six months now or whatever, yeah, it took me it took me a hot minute to get back up. Yeah. Well, the good thing is that that summer recycle is like you get a little bit of time to get some meat back on your bones in that in that Florida Chow Hall. Do they have you guys doing PT in the morning? So they had, we did PT twice. Okay. Um, there was, and it was the same, uh, the same RI both times. Mm-hmm. And it was just abysmal because he, he had us do like a two mile run for time. And it was, <laughs> it was awful. I mean, <laughs> You're just beaten down your body's like, you know, eating itself. And then it's like, oh, we're going to do a, basically a PT test. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, yeah. We only did PT twice that and it was i think that's the only time i did pt the entire time i was there mm-hmm. um but yeah like you know abysmal abysmal two mile of course no one really no one really cared no one gave a um, fuck. <laughs> but yeah the the chow hall i liked i think i may have i mean i was there for so long i may have liked it better than than mountains i actually oh no 100 percent. the the floor chow hall good. is way better than mountains like those dang uh the french toast bro yeah, French toast. They, Slathering uh, that with some cream cheese and syrup, dude. Oh. <laughs> tater tots. I think they yeah, the smiley tots, face dude. tater tots, dude. Yes. Those things dude. hit. Awesome. And then um, so one, one thing I did, we were going to be there for so long. So they assigned you like you had to pick what kind of uh, detail you wanted to be a part of. Since mm-hmm. you're going to be there for so long, you're just going to be doing details and everything. Well, I signed up to be the uh, one of the Gator boys for the Gator Lounge. There was nice. like there was like three of us, all bad dudes took it. Um, and the only downside was whenever they went to the Gator Lounge, you had to you had, you to, had work. to work it. Yeah. So to me, that was a very very small price to pay from <laughs> filling sandbags or pulling weeds. Oh, dude, the so freaking I'm, they didn't do that for us. It was just like all right all the recyclers are going to go clean up this objective or we're going to go weed the jump pits today. Oh man. I hated that. <laughs> that was yeah. the worst. Yeah. The, the first, I think the first couple of days when you have to clean up all the objectives, that's like the, the that was actually kind of fun. Like you, you go out and you get to walk around the objectives and it's like, all right, I'm going to remember this if I get this one next time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then he graduated in August of, of 19 uh yeah august 19th. Okay. and then that's 
So like that's when it was a very unique situation. So when I came back, um, that's when we had gone through like that huge hazing investigation. Okay. And so it like wiped out certain leadership and all of a sudden there was this batch of new tabs and all of a sudden we just kind of got thrust into leadership positions as, as new tabs. Cause it, I mean, I think we lost six or seven guys in the platoon. Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden now you're like a team leader and it was like a, like a year or two kind of, of almost rebuilding the platoon and kind of making it, making it better. But I mean, I think everything kind of turned out for the better because it, it, it was kind of getting out of, <laughs> it was kind of getting out of control, but mm-hmm. yeah, there was that whole thing. Okay. To, to kind of maybe back it up here, I get when people ask about mortars are like, obviously you're going to be shooting mortars during the training cycle, but everyone's always asking like, do I still get to do like battle drill six? Do I get to go and shoot my rifle as much? How is that balance between your mortar job, like shooting mortars at the range and, you know, regular kind of infantry stuff where you're, you're on the line shooting, shooting your rifle, pistol, whatever. So normally it was like, we would do maybe it used to be not, not that much. Like, um, like when I was in, it was maybe two flat ranges, uh, a train cycle that might be, that might be as much as, as much as you could get. And then BD six was just not, unless you were attached to a lot. I mean, that was the one thing I kind of liked about being on a, attached to a line platoon is sometimes you could integrate yourself into their training because you're not so much on the mortar platoon training cycle. Whenever you're 60, you can just integrate yourself and just become whatever that platoon's training cycle is and get more involved with uh, on that side. So as far as like one good thing about being on a 60 is it can be as proactive as an experience as you decide to make it. So the more the platoon likes you, the more you hang out with them, the more you build rapport with the platoon sergeant and PL, the more they might use you or invite you along to some of their training. But with the uh, with the switch, they actually, as uh, regiments kind of going back to more garrison, it seems like they're trying to make just all units a little bit more well-versed. And so actually more platoon now from my understanding, does a lot more of that. Okay. You're getting, yeah, you're getting the BD6 training. You're doing a lot more ranges. And in fact, uh, at least at uh, 175, Mortar Platoon actually, right before I got out, conducted their first like actual live fire lane, like as a as a line platoon would, like not just support. Oh, really? Had, as a platoon, a, conducted, a platoon live fire. Yeah, they had their own support oh, wow. or their own assault force. Yeah, they it was their own. Action. And they weren't shooting mortars. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, oh, I wow. they were like, I, I think there was, was probably a, like a mortar team or two. Yeah, 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 yeah. But as far as like having their own actual lane, that's something that they that's, that's cool. That they actually did. And from everything that I heard, they actually they actually crushed it. So they seem one of the, I guess, maybe positives uh, as you go to a more garrison life is they're kind of trying to expand all their capabilities so you are starting to do a lot more infantry tactics not just more capabilities oh wow that's i mean that's good news for anyone that's uh coming in and coming in as a mortarman like because again a lot of people are like i don't want to i want to do the cool guy stuff too it's like it sounds like you're going to be able to get to do that a lot more now so that's a, yeah, a bit and- of hope yeah. And as far as like, if I'm like looking into the future for that, like the next big thing to pop off, whatever it may be, um, when you're dealing with like an enemy that has the, the same assets as you, I don't think it's going to be one from the air. It's going to be, I think mortars, if anything, are going to start to be a little more used. As oh, 100%. As, if I'm, if I'm looking into it, the mortar capability is going to be a lot more heavily leveraged. Well, you just look at, I mean, we can, we don't have to say that we think we're going to get involved in Ukraine. I don't think that we will personally, but like, if we're looking at that conflict currently, artillery and mortars have a huge role to play right now. So extrapolating that into, into us where we've been kind of fighting an unconventional war against students and freaking, you know, mud huts, you know, fighting a more conventional force, you are going to need some more of that organic fire support, which regiment already has, and it's already very well integrated. So for the people yeah. that are thinking, you know, oh, mortars are never going to get used. Well, 
be careful what you wish for. <laughs> no, yeah. a mortar fight. That's like the worst. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no, thanks. <laughs> we got to, we got to shoot mortars a little bit in, uh, in Syria in 18. And we got to the mortar teams took us out and showed us kind of how to, how to sight them and, uh, how to fire them. And we got to hang some sixties and some, uh, some 81s kind of out at the base we were, we were by. And that was a lot of fun. I was like, man, this is cool. I wouldn't want to do it as a job, but I like hanging around. So I'll do this all day. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the admin and the getting it out there, getting it set up. Rocking with, day- if rocking with that 60 round ruck as well. Yeah, that that gets that gets a uh, that gets a little heavy. Or God forbid, you might have to ruck a <laughs> the base plate. Hopefully, not ruck an eighty one. Oh God, um, I can't even imagine. It would be, <laughs> it would be uh, that'd be freaking awful. One twenty would be where it's at. That's when you had the vehicle. The, 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 the freaking Gator with the uh, <laughs> with the John on the back. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> good stuff. And then, did you go over in twenty? Were you back again? Uh, 20. Yeah. The, the, uh, <laughs> the COVID year the co- where the, uh, <laughs> no one did shit. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The, the quick trip and then the, uh, mm, the quick, yeah. Cause we did, we both did the quick trip. Um, that was a big nothing burger, but it was kind of cool. Yeah. It, it was like a, I guess, check off, check off the, check off the list. You were with three alpha for that, right? Cause you were yeah. with, uh, I'm not going to say his name, but uh, he was our old platoon sergeant. Then he came over to be y'all's platoon sergeant. Yeah. 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 yeah, That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and then after that, yeah, did the, uh, the the COVID had the whole experience of, uh, dude, that, that was, uh, that was dumb. That that was one of my biggest memories was just that experience of being, being, uh, just quarantined at (laughs) At bath, dude. I was in the jock. I worked the jock for that trip. And they try to make it silly in there. And I just was not going to have it. I was like, I'm not wearing my fucking mask at my desk for 12 hours. You can suck my ass. <laughs> Dude, it's better than just getting to-go plates for... Yeah, oh, the to-go. Yeah, that shit was whack too. Although Task we did for, have a rehearsal. COVID. <laughs> yeah, dude. At least we had the rehearsal after uh, at the very beginning of the quick trip. Mm-hmm. When like we couldn't, we couldn't eat at the chow halls and we had to do the get-to-go plates. That was like a a prequel to to how COVID is going to be. Yeah. And then that, well, yeah. And the, the quarantine freaking at a battalion and everything. Oh, like, dude. Just getting fenced in and everything like that for. Yeah. Two that was I don't insane. know. If, I don't know if I've talked about that. Yeah. So, so before we deployed, this was like at the height of COVID, like at the, when people started really kind of freaking out about it, maybe not at the height, because it kind of started in March. Um, but we were slated, 1st Battalion was slated to deploy and there was talks of either us not deploying and they were just going to extend 375 or we were going to go, but we were going to do a legitimate like lockdown quarantine before we went to make sure that no one had it. So what they did was they literally fenced in 1st Ranger Battalion and it was about a, uh, a quarter mile by quarter mile square area of our company operating facilities, the battalion headquarters building and the gyms. And they had a fence with legitimate freaking razor wire separating, or maybe sea wire is a, yeah, I think it was sea wire <laughs> separating us from the barracks. Um, that we're also a part of uh, first battalion's footprint and we weren't allowed to have any kind of outside contact. People weren't allowed to, to bring us stuff directly that had to sit in its own quarantine for like two or three days before we could get it. Uh, and the thing where they messed up was that there was no limit on booze. So it turned into a two-week frat party, essentially. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I set up my own. Uh, I had my my own like little small coffee business. No one brought. No one had brought in coffee, and coffee was like the one thing. Like having a nice coffee set up was like my one uh, thing. I went religious with on uh, deployments. So I had like a nice French press, five-pound bag of coffee. So I got to sell it and actually nice. made. It actually made some not not too much because uh you start charging guys too much and then they can completely just overthrow your business um, yeah <laughs> yeah made, made a little little set up shop uh in the mez and actually made a little bit of money out of it <laughs> <laughs> that one i can't i can't say my experience was the same um i was already pissed that i was having to go over as the jock nco like i mm-hmm. was like i was angry and uh our company was going to be team BAF and 
I mean, obviously they were talking, oh, we're going to go out, we're going to go out, you know, do stuff. And I was pissed that I was, had missed another team BAF deployment. And I remember the the ACO CO one night when we were just outside, you know, chilling with a chilling with whiskey. He's like, don't worry, we'll get you all jock in COs out on target. Don't worry about it. And I was like, every single CO I've had it has told me they're going to get me out on target and none of them have fulfilled it. And so I was so pissed that I went to the arms room and I signed out a Mark 48 and I threw on my rucksack. I packed my ruck, I threw it on. I was like, I'm walking until the sun comes up. I was hammered. I was like a quarter of a, I was like half a handle of rum in. Um, and I was just belligerently drunk. I was like, I'm going to walk till the sun comes up with my machine gun. Cause I'm so angry. And yeah, I, I just started machine. doing, yeah, I started doing laps around the freaking, the little compound. You weren't a penis too? No, I, it was just, oh. it was just a ruck. I was just in, <laughs> in, in civvy PTs of the 48 in, oh, okay. uh, in my ruck. And I was just doing laps. It was about a half mile per lap. And I got to about lap 15 and I was like, I ain't going, the booze was starting to wear off and the sun was starting to maybe come up. I was like, all right, we're just going to do a 12 mile. We're not going to walk till the morning. We're just going to do 12 mile and call it good. And by about mile nine, 10, I was sober. And I was like, well, I can't quit now because people are still out and still watching kind of not watching me, but like playing can jam and shit. But yeah. I was like, I got to finish at least a 12 miler. And I did it under, I did it under three hours, piss drunk. And I was like, all right, cool. I know that I can, I can pass a 12 miler no matter the conditions. <laughs> yeah i, I don't i don't i didn't i didn't actually see it but i saw a couple of recordings of it like i remember <laughs> people were just taking videos <laughs> i have one too i'll i'm gonna I'm edit in here but yeah dude it was the best two weeks of my time in the army until we both deployed to iraq together in 21 and then that was top top tier army experience <laughs> yeah that was the, that yeah that was the high that was definitely the the high point <laughs> the high point for yep. me too yeah and i mean that was so i guess that was actually i was supposed to go over there and actually re-enlist and then um the uh withdrawal happened and mm -hmm. that's when that kind of made my decision or that's when i started making moves like all right well everything's changing. I should probably change too. And it's probably my time to get out. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I remember you telling me about, uh, honor foundation over there and you were, uh, when we were hanging out in the ranger in. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had signed up for, yeah. That's when I signed up for uh THF and everything. We went through that together mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, that's, that's also, I was probably that's like the cornerstone thing you should do if if you are getting out. I mean, I would highly recommend THF is like setting that groundwork, the foundation for the rest of your transition as far as what it builds on. So for those not in the know and for dudes who are special ops and getting out. So Honor Foundation is a nonprofit third party entity that basically is like your transition assistance program on actual steroids um and it actually does good things for you instead of just like oh here's a here's a couple classes you have to take all right you're ready for civilian life no honor foundation is specifically geared towards dudes who did a little bit more with their time and it's like 13 weeks of teaching you how to network teaching you how to you know do job interviews how to write a resume how to do linkedin all this like really foundational kind of more corporate i guess more corporate kind of skills um they're going to teach you to to effectively get a job outside and then the network as well is gigantic and the intent is for you to to network while you're in it um do what they, they call these cups of coffee and basically find a career field that you're interested in and they have you know a list of about 300 and it's growing continually 300 people in all different kinds of uh sectors and the intent is for you to basically go and, and talk to these people and figure out you know your next step so you got your job through through that, didn't you? Yeah. So I connected with the chief revenue officer that was in the cup of coffee directory. Ended up, that's the job I took. Ended up, uh, I literally like just left that job. I left it in December and I literally just started my new role. Like I've only been in it for like a week and a half. Okay. Nice. <clears throat> So I guess maybe kind of backtracking here to, to mortar life. What, what advice do you got for, uh, 
for dudes who are scared, who are coming in with, you know, the 11 x-ray um, and they're, they're scared of getting that Charlie. <laughs> I mean, life, life's not going <clears> to, <throat> life's not going to be over. I mean, it's really not, there's a lot of, uh, it's more or less like sh- shit talk, but really it is a, uh, it is a, a tight, a tight unit once you're in. I mean, there's been some just hard dudes that have gone through uh, mortar platoon. I mean, we had a guy get his leg blown off and he's still serving. I mean, you, you do get some, uh, some hard dudes going in. It's all what you make it. <laughs> yeah. It, it is, you know, it's not going to be the same as being an 11 Bravo, but like, don't let that distract from the, ability like you were saying you know it is what you make it like you can still have a kick-ass career and do a lot of cool things as a mortar and if you think that your life is over because you got truck it's not you'll be all right i've also heard of dudes showing up and they were chucks and they're like we don't need chucks like you're just going to go to a line platoon so that does happen doesn't happen very often um but yeah got a couple go ahead (laughs) there are there were a couple unfortunate uh whenever i first got in they were actually really hurting there was a couple of bravos they brought over that became oh no <laughs> that became chucks like i think there was three total okay so you're not safe at all if the so that was, two needs guys they're gonna get you <laughs> <laughs> they got to yeah they get to a 175 they're like you guys are uh you guys are charlie's now <laughs> never seen a mortar before in their life <laughs> yeah so that was, um, that's 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 interesting that's yeah that probably doesn't happen that often either um i got a few questions from dudes what's the most your favorite piece of gear that you were issued this one's kind of a kind of a whack question but uh, uh well i'll go if we're just going like uh let's talk let's talk uh clothing we'll talk like snivel gear like clothing wise uh favorite piece of like or like boots or whatever and then we can talk like you know maybe tactical gear three alpha yeah that's like by far the it's the most sought after and it and it's one that's guys uh they just seem to lose it all the time so you got to keep like uh yeah <laughs> well lose it well lose it and then take yours but take yeah, yours yep <laughs> the, the three alpha was my that was the go-to freaking uh piece of uh piece of equipment i would say just all around all around three alpha was like my favorite freaking thing mm-hmm. so for the dudes not in the know it was basically it's a patagonia made the most of them um it's basically just this soft shell it's not even a shell jacket it's just this uh zip up padded kind of uh synthetic jacket i don't even know what's in it it's almost like a it's almost like a wooby but it's not wooby material um super lightweight super packable and just super cozy for really any kind of situation yeah definitely definitely that and if i had to get gear uh probably uh, you know what i'm gonna say 31 alphas because for a while I rocked old school 15s and when I made the transition it was like the night became day it was Mm -hmm. it was it was the greatest thing ever I loved I love 31 alphas yeah no those are those are great I have my own set of 15s and they are they're nice you know it's nice being able to see in the dark but they're heavy they're heavy and white phosphorus is just so much easier on your eyes or white phosphor, not phosphorus, yeah. white phosphor, white phosphorus is what you drop yeah. on people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> white phosphor is just so much easier on your eyes. Like I get a headache looking through green phosphor for more than like four or five hours. Like I get a, a, some killer headaches. Um, but yeah, the 31 alphas are, are killer. Yeah. Light. You don't even really need, I mean, you don't even really need a count a counterweight. Um, no. You can still do it, but yeah, that it is so easy to it is so easy. To, that it was the greatest thing ever. The first time I saw through those, <laughs> <laughs> my life has changed. Good shit, man. Well, you know, we've run for about an hour. That's about as long as I as I try to keep these. But uh, trying to think if there's any any closing thoughts you've got. I guess um, advice for dudes coming in. Um, anything you want to want to say to the people. Uh, basically, 
I would stay away from any kind of really <laughs> programs. It's more or less just digging down and just having grit. I mean, hmm. if you want, if you want it, there's nothing that's going to stop you and you can watch all the videos you want, but um, it's a completely different experience once you're there. So if you want it bad enough, nothing's going to stop you. Yeah. I like, I kind of agree with you on that program thing. Cause that is another question. Like what program should I do? It's like, do you, well, first of all, I don't know enough information to give you an answer off. I don't know how good you are at running. I don't know how good you are at pushups. I don't know how good you are at sit-ups and rucking and pull-ups and shit. So it's like, I'm already not able to answer your question just based off that. But if you want it bad enough, I mean, asking someone who's done it is a good thing to do. Um, and I, I'm not telling you to stop doing that. Um, but there's a lot of resources out there and the standards are published online, right? So work backwards yeah. off the standards and realize, all right, this is how fast I need to run my, you know, my five mile. This is where I'm currently at. And then, okay. And then you got to figure out, okay, I need to get faster at running and then, you know, go off of that. Um, and it is, it does, you know, physical, the physical stuff is important, but it does come down to, to your heart. Like you were saying, like, if you want it bad enough, like you're going to get it. And it doesn't matter if you're a, you know, you don't need to be a physical stud to get, get through it. That's uh you need to have a base level. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, like there's, there's absolute beasts who still end up quitting because, they're not able to to control their mind and they're not, they're not truly committed to it. So. Yeah, definitely the, uh, the positive mindset. And I mean, even though, you know, even though they're going back to more garrison life now, anything, anything could, anything could pop off. Something, something always tends to happen. Mm -hmm. Especially. Yeah. I mean, my half my deployments were like, technically no notice like anything yeah. can happen at any time when it comes to regiment so and you'll be probably the, the first few people to to react like we did in, in 2001 with a uh, objective rhino in 375 like it's gonna be it's gonna be ranger you know doing something more more likely than not yeah yeah definitely i agree all righty well you don't really have a, a huge social media presence so i'm not gonna no, we don't, we don't uh, need to plug that. Um, you don't need to plug the social say, media. Just we don't uh, need to do that. Uh, <laughs> I guess thanks for coming on, man. Um, you know, this was fun. This is, uh, you know, I think a lot of good info for the mortar guys. Yeah, no so, problem, man. And uh, congrats on the whole uh, podcast and everything. Seems thank to be, you. Yeah, seems no, to be it's doing, uh, pretty well. Yeah, it's fun. Um, kind of my niche, I guess. Trying to branch out, you know, bring other kind of people on, but. Uh, there is a, a large, there's not a whole lot of Rangers doing shit, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I've said it before. It's like, it's kind of tough to walk that line. Cause it's like, I don't want to give away all the sauce and I don't want to tell all the secrets. Uh, but I do want to kind of help people out in making decisions if they want to, you know, go for Ranger or not. And that's kind of, kind of the intent here. So appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, you got the, yeah, you're doing a different, uh, different style and everything is you're doing like tactical videos and stuff like yeah. that basic stuff it's not getting into the into the weeds too much yeah i would love to run like you know maybe like a range or raid class but like that's still stuff that they're using so it's like i'm not gonna give them yeah. the sauce on that i'll give the ranger school you know range raid class which will which i will do but uh not the cool not the cool stuff sorry people <laughs> <laughs> all righty uh, yeah i don't think we'll wrap it up there appreciate it again um yeah Give the video a like if you made it to the end. <laughs> Comment down below um, and we'll see you next week. Have a good one.